thank you for coming and agreeing to speak to us about the, uh, the new law. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions for you. Following Senator Mark K. Grossman from WBEZ, we'll talk about the stakeholders and community um, members. So Senator Markwick, are you ready to start? I, I'm happy to. Um, okay, and uh, thank you everyone for uh, inviting me to speak with you today. And thank you for your interest in this initiative. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. God knows over the course of the last seven, seven and a half years, I've talked about it plenty. Um, so uh, just a little historical background. Um, this initiative for an elected school board of course historically speaking chicago is the one school district in the state of illinois that has never had an elected board of education every other school district in the state has an elected board to to govern the way that the schools are operated uh make hiring decisions uh decide on tax levies and how to spend the money um chicago has never had that 130 540 years without um, <clears throat> any sort of elected representation. There have been movements uh, throughout the course of history, um, minor movements to create an elected school board, but I would say that the most recent grew up around um, uh, an initiative under uh, Mayor Richard M. Daley um, that happened in 2005, and I'm forgetting the name of it now, it was, it was, it was a way of, of reinventing public education by 2010. What it involved was largely closing uh, neighborhood uh, public schools and replacing them with privatized charter schools. Um, and Chicago embarked on its first massive school closings. Um, and most of those were in predominantly Renaissance 2010. Thank you very much for the, uh, the uh, reminder. Yes, Renaissance 2010. And uh, most of those were in, in predominantly minority and disadvantaged communities. And um, the process was not inclusive. Um, people felt that their voices about the decisions that were made around the schools that affected their neighborhoods and educated their children, that they did not have the say that in a democracy we're supposed to have. And so the most recent, I would say, elected push for an elected school board began. Um, Community groups started organizing around accountability. They started circulating petitions to try and place questions on the ballot about whether or not there would be an elected school board. When I first ran as a state representative in 2012, I would knock on doors and, and tell, and people would say, okay, Martwick, you want us to vote for you? What are you about? And I would talk about the things that, that I stood for. And one of them was an elected school board for the Chicago Public Schools. And I will say that in the 2012 election up here on the Northwest side, most people said, oh, that's interesting. Never thought about that before. Um, and I point that out because the success of creating an elected school board um, was perhaps one of the finest and, and most sustained grassroots organizing efforts um, I've, I've ever been involved in. And, and I'd like to think it's one of the, the best I've ever seen. Um, what started out as a, a handful of uh, interested people organizing around this issue sustained from the be very beginnings in, in 2005, um, all the way up until the time that this passed last year. And you think about that, to have that sort of sustained grassroots effort. And the more we talked about this issue and we started to highlight the problems that occurred under the appointed board, the more people started to realize, hey, I don't know if an elected school board, and, and this is something I've always talked about, I, I don't, I didn't never suggested that an elected school board would be the solution for all of Chicago's educational problems. But what it would do is it would allow us an adequate voice in the decision-making process. And that's what democracy demands, right? Um, we are supposed to, right? What's the old adage? No taxation without representation. And yet the vast majority of tax dollars that is that you send to government, whether it's the federal government, the state government, or the local government is spent on education. And yet here in the city of Chicago, we had no say. And, and yet the, the failures of this um, 
appointed board were were clear, uh, whether it was uh, decision making without uh, public engagement, whether it was a lack of accountability. We think about the Barbara Bird Bennett scandal where she, you know, and, and it wasn't that she committed corruption elected. We all in the city of Chicago, we all know elected officials can can commit uh, corrupt acts. But the idea that a board rubber stamped a twenty five million dollar no bid contract to her immediate past employer without any discussion, without any debate, without any dissent. Um, that, that was crazy, right? And as it turned out, it was a kickback scheme. And the idea that there would, no one would even scrutinize this um, at, the, at the board level showed that this appointed board was merely a rubber stamp. It was not doing that sort of engagement that we, we wanted. And if they weren't gonna do it on something as, as clear, you know, that as a, uh, a no bid contract to a former employer, well, then what else were they not scrutinizing adequately? And so, um, again, the push continued. So it was about seven years ago, uh, even though I campaigned on supporting an elected school board, it was about seven, seven and a half years ago that I actually wrote legislation and proposed legislation to create an elected school board. And it was dramatically different what had been proposed in the past and past efforts really hadn't gone anywhere. Um, and it was when I finally proposed this legislation that we finally started to get some legislative movement and with the legislative movement came attention. And as I said, and I talk about the success of this grassroots effort in 2012, I'll repeat, I knocked on doors and said, I support an elected school board. And the response I most often got was, well, it's interesting, I'd never thought about that. By the time this passed, um, Mayor Lightfoot, who had decided, who had supported this in her campaign efforts, but then decided once she took office that she was very much opposed to it, on, before the passage of this bill, proactively reached out to legislators personally, called them personally, said, I want you to vote no for this. And legislators resoundingly told the mayor, we're not going to do that because when I ran for office, I didn't have to tell people that I supported an elected school board. My constituents asked me, where do you stand? Are you going to support an elected school board? Because this is what I want. And that was the success of this long-term sustained grassroots efforts to educate people about why Chicago would benefit from an elected school board. Um, so, so that's the history of how it came about. Um, let me run through a little bit of the details of what's contained in the bill. And then, of course, I'm happy to answer questions about anything, process, um, history, or again, details of the bill that perhaps I don't touch on. So um, what will happen is, is in the 2024 general election cycle, meaning November of 2024, the first elections for the Chicago Board of Education will be held. Um, it will be to elect half of the members of the school board of the city of Chicago. And then the final half plus the school board president will be elected in the 2026 election cycle. This was a compromise in order to create an orderly transition from appointed uh, to elected. Instead of having one fell swoop, we agreed to phase it in over the course of two elections. The structure of the board is unique, and that's not surprising because the Chicago uh, public school system is unique, not just in size, but also in diversity, right? When you think about schools in Lincoln Park versus schools in Morgan Park, uh, there's very little that, that they share in common. And so we wanted to make sure that whatever corner of the city was, that there was adequate representation for the issues that they, um, that those communities and those schools were dealing with. Additionally, um, one of the big motivators in creating the school board and one of the things that we tried to address through the structure was ensuring that the elected school board members would look like the diversity of the city of Chicago. We felt that diverse representation was very important. Um, and we also wanted to ensure that obviously one of the pitfalls of elected, um, you know, any sort of elected office is the influence of outside money and interests on the elections. And so we wanted to do what we could at least structurally to minimize it. No way to eliminate it until, you know, we change our form of government, but limit the influence of, of money on the course of the elections. The answer to that 
was a unique structure that is different from most school boards. Most school boards throughout the state have between seven and 11 members. The Chicago Public Schools will have 20 members of its elected school board, actually 21, but uh, 20 um, elected members. And instead of being elected at large in the school district, we would elect them from drawn districts. So there would be 20 drawn districts. I said 21, not 20. 20 drawn districts, but there would be one citywide elected school board president. So um, the reasoning for this unique structure, again, was to, to address those three things, uh, making sure that you have local representation, that it is a diverse board, um, and that we limit the influence of outside money so that everyone that can have access to serve. Um, those those were, were very important. But these were also sort of a response to um, other, there, there was a, one very notable switch from appointed to elected that in my view uh, didn't work out so well and that was the city of Los Angeles. So the city of Los Angeles went from a seven member appointed board to a seven member elected board, all of those seats being elected citywide. And um, the pitfall there was that because they were running across a district, you know, very similar in size to Chicago, three million people, um, and, and everyone was running citywide, uh, the outside influence of outside money was, was profound. In fact, the Koch brothers, if you're familiar with them, came in and literally spent, um, I believe it was between a million and two million on each election and literally won every seat on the Los Angeles elected school board. And so we said, okay, that, that, that's a, something we'd like to try and avoid. We want everyday average people. And so by cutting into 20 districts, we sit roughly halfway between what is a representative district and what is a Senate district in terms of size. So it'd be about 135,000 people, actually closer to a representative district than a Senate district, slightly larger. Um, and at 135,000 people, you know, that's basically two and a half wards, we figured then that your grassroots involvement, uh, your ability to organize on a local level to be involved, you know, if you're involved in your park district, in your PTA or an LSC, or, you know, you've been involved, then you probably will fare better than someone who just spends a bunch of money. And that was the idea behind that. Um, the elected school board president citywide was an attempt to address a concern, and I think valid that people had, that what if these elections roll around and we don't make educated choices, right? Um, I can think of two instances where sometimes, not anyone in this group, but our, our average voter walks in the booth and might not make an educated choice. And those two offices are a judge, right? And a um, uh, Water Reclamation District is the other one I like to talk about. And I like to point out Water Reclamation District um, because it is a, a billion and a half dollar a year government that it provides one of the most essential services that we have, right? Which is taking wastewater and turning it into clean water and returning it to the lake. And yet I would guess that probably at least eight out of 10 voters walk in and take a look at the slate of candidates running for Water Reclamation District. And they all say the same thing who the heck are these people, right? Um, and, and I think that that is structurally because they're running across the entire county and with no elected executive, in other words, the board is elected and then they choose the president of the board from amongst the elected members. And that's the way most school districts work is that's how they operate. But without that election um, for that one executive position, you know, the Chicago media has a lot to cover and they don't really cover the election for a water reclamation district. But I would point out, if you look at the city of Chicago, your average alderman doesn't get a whole lot of coverage. And yet most voters probably make a pretty informed decision about their alderman because of the news coverage of what happens in the city of Chicago, primarily because we have a strong executive. Same thing in the Chicago area. When you elect people like me in the General Assembly, most voters, you know, polling would say at least, you know, half or more of the voters, they don't know who we are, but they judge us based on the news coverage of the governor and what's going on in the state of Illinois. 
Um, and so the idea with the citywide elected school board president was to, to create one position, the executive uh, branch of that government, who would be elected by the entire city at large, not selected from by the board. And then, of course, not only would they be, uh, you know, um, representing the entire city and elected from the entire city, but they would receive that media attention probably only second to the mayor's election in the city of Chicago. And that would help to educate voters about the issues that the school board is facing so that they could then judge their local candidates and their local school board district races. So that's the elected school board. Again, the first 10 will be elected in 2024. We have about one year left to draw the map. So we'll have maps probably available May of 2023 so that they'll be ready for the November 2024 election. Um, we'll elect 10 districts in 2024, 10 districts in 2026, and the school board president. Um, there were some conflicts of interest provisions that were put in to make sure that uh, no one who was an active employee of the district could run for the district um, or, or run to, to uh, be a, a representative on the school board. Um, and uh, we are working on, on other measures in addition to some of the things that we negotiated. We negotiated a moratorium on school closings. Um, so we shut down all school closings until after the elected board should take uh, office. And again, I think that this was important because I think that the feeling was that school closings were done based off of insider conversations, not a representative vote of the city at large about whether or not school closings should happen. And, you know, the, the, the city is going to have, the, the school district is going to continue to have financial problems and delivery of education problems, and, and they're going to have to face those decisions. But we put the moratorium in place until the elected school board can make decisions that we can then weigh in through the course of elections. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure I've probably forgotten something, but I'm hopefully that if, if people have questions, we can, uh, we can uh, address those as well. So um, with that, I, I will say thank you to everyone for your attention and I will open it up to questions. And I'll be happy to answer anything I can. Hi everyone, this is Madeline Raz and I'm gonna be coordinating the questions. Um, we have two questions in the chat right now, but for those of you who are uh, contemplating a question, please look for the chat function at the bottom of the visual and enter your chat uh, question, or I'm sorry, enter your question in the chat. Uh, first question we have, and uh, Senator Martwick, you, you started to speak to this, and this is about the districts. Um, you referenced how many districts there will be in the justification for that amount, but how will they actually be drawn? Um, thank you, uh, great question, and there was, uh... There was a lot of talk about that. Um, uh, how would the districts be drawn? So ultimately and eventually, um, like every other mapping uh, process, every other, whether it's the city council, the county board, the general assembly, um, those maps will be, un until there is a change in law, like if, 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 if Illinois adopts some sort of, uh, you know, mapping commission or nonpartisan process, then it would be done in accordance with the laws. Since those laws don't exist right now, um, the way it's scheduled is that eventually the school district will draw its own maps, but the first set of maps will be drawn by the General Assembly. The reasoning behind that was um, we figured, well, the first set of maps has to be drawn by some form of government that has the infrastructure available to draw the maps. The school district does not have that because it's not part of what they do at this moment. Um, and so that really left the General Assembly or the City Council to draw maps. And um, I, I don't think there is really any um, discernible benefit one way or the other. I, I would say that when it, when it was first proposed to me seven and a half years ago, who's going to draw the maps? My response was, I don't really care. Um, when I had to choose, I chose, I'm sorry if you hear squealing, I've got young kids and they're having a blast out there. So uh, forgive the background noise if you hear it. Um, the, uh, the, uh, I chose ultimately the General Assembly and my reasoning was, and again, I'm not suggesting it was right, but I had to choose, was that for that first set of maps, I wanted to take it 
as far away from, you know, we know it's going to be a political process drawing the maps, but I wanted to remove as much of the personal interest politics as possible. And um, if the aldermen were drawing the maps, I think there would be uh, more of that than if the General Assembly was drawing the maps. Does that make sense? I mean, we are somewhat removed. The people that are going to be weighing in on this are everyone in the state of Illinois versus just the aldermen that are contiguous with those districts. And I wanted to remove as much of the, oh, draw, I don't want, that guy lives over there and I don't want him to run for, uh, you know, in my district and then run against me as alderman. And, you know, I wanted to eliminate as much of that as possible. So that's what we did. General Assembly will draw the first maps and then the school district will draw its own maps after that. So Senator Moore, we have a, a lot of questions coming in specific to the districts. So um, we're going to try to condense them and hopefully uh, get condensed responses back. Sure. Uh, right now, it's our understanding that the first 10 districts were supposed to be drawn by February 22, February 2nd of this year. So based on what you said, it doesn't sound like that's been done yet. Is that correct? So um, that was in the initial legislation and understand that the, the bill was originally drawn seven years ago. So as we kept updating the bill, that was one of those provisions that didn't get moved forward. There's no need to get it done by February of 2022 since the election's not until November of 2024. And it will be, by the way, nonpartisan. It will not be a partisan election, meaning the, the school board members will run um, without any party tag after their name, right? So there won't be a, a, they won't appear in the primary election, only in the general election without a designation. So yeah. that's why we moved that date back in the most recent version of the bill until May of 2023. Okay, so tagging on to that, then there'll be 10 um, initial ones. So what determines which are the first 10? And then what determines what comes in the next round? So that hasn't been sorted out yet. Um, I can tell you briefly what some of the ideas are. Some of the ideas would be to just draw districts out of the hat, but for fear that one side of the city just out of sheer luck would get elected and one would be appointed, um, I proposed drawing 10 districts, actually drawing 20 districts, but in groups of two, and then removing a line so the first set of elections would be in, in 10 districts, but everyone would get to weigh in. And then the next year, the line would be removed and the, the, the side that didn't have a representative living in it would be elected in the 2026 election. So we're working through that, but uh, that has not yet been determined exactly how that will be done. Okay, and then uh, speaking specifically of the election, um, why is the school board election on the state slash national cycle of elections and not at the same time as the city elections such as for mayor or alderman? Um, yes, and the, the, the answer is that that was part of negotiations um, that had again, been changed so many times over the course of seven years. It was, um, that was a compromise. I believe it was the mayor's request that it happened then. Um, the idea is to promote turnout. Typically in the November elections, we have much higher turnout than we do in the February municipal elections. And so it was to capture the turnout to have more people involved. Um, and then uh, some other questions we have. Um, have they have you articulated what the powers of the elected school board president specifically would be so does the school board president have the right to veto for example um so the 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 duties and the responsibilities of the board of education uh would have not been enumerated in a way that is any different than any board of education currently exists. So as it currently exists, there is a board, there is a president. Um, every elected board, there is a board and a president. The powers and duties currently would remain the same. That could change in future legislation if there is a need to be, if we you know, notice something that needs to be done, that, that's what we do, we change those things. But right now it would just be part and parcel, just like any other elected board. Okay. So are there, and then will there be qualifications specified for candidates to run for office or 
um, any kind of skill sets or areas of expertise that will be emphasized? Uh, no, um, and, and uh, that was by design. Um, as I, I think we're probably all well aware, the job of an elected or of a school board is not to run the schools. It is um, to run the government that, the governmental unit that creates the operations of the school. The schools are run by superintendents, principals, and teachers, um, and business agents, and so on and so forth, that the board would hire. Um, so just like every other legislative body, and again, this is you know, going back to our, our 101 on government, a school board is a legislative body. And just like every other legislative body in the United States of America, there would be no qualifications to serve. So everyone is affected and everyone is interested in the operation of their schools, whether you have children or you don't, if you, if you live near a school, if you, you are paying taxes to them and your public safety, your economic development, the value of your home are all going to be affected by this. So we left it wide open. Anyone can run, anyone can serve. The qualifications of those individual candidates, that should be the, the job of judging those qualifications is in the hands of the voters. And um, this is not a question from the chat. This was one from our uh, education committee. Uh, we had an initial, initial thought about how these kinds of elections would be funded, and you kind of referred to what's happened in other cities. And so is there going to be any effort to avoid big money into um, something as uh, close to our children as the school board election? Yes, um, there are constant discussions about how we could prevent that. Again, when I was creating this, um, when I first drafted this legislation, people said, oh, why don't you come up with a fair maps commission? I said, hold on a second here. Fair maps is a huge issue and should be its own issue. It don't make me recreate the wheel. I'm just trying to create an elected board from an appointed board within the confines of the current elections. So someone said to me, you should take on campaign finance reform with your elected school board. I said, okay, not really fair, right? Because that's gonna be its own enormous issue and I'm hugely supportive of it. And I'm happy to adopt campaign finance reform measures, but I did not want the elected board to fail because it was, layered on top with another enormous issue that people have particular feelings about. But we have talked about adopting things like public financing of elections. Um, the reality of it is, is that, as I said, given our the makeup of our current Supreme Court, um, there is no limits to what people can really spend on elections. Oh, there is, but not really. We know that. Um, and, and again, I, I don't want to say, well, I'm not going to have an elected school board until campaign finance reform is completed, that would be silly. So, so we're gonna, we're gonna marshal forward. We've created a structure that will hopefully limit the influence of outside money. Smaller districts require smaller money. I know that, I've run in all different size districts. Um, um, but again, we're gonna try and, we're, we're considering things like public financing uh, of elections. And I, I would, be, I'm, would be in huge support of that. I think that would be good for the whole, you know, if we started in the Chicago Public Schools and it seeps out into other elections, that would be good too. So tagging on to that, um, you know, we talked about skill sets and expertise, but is there an age requirement to run for the board? There is, I, I, think, I think it's 18. So a CPS student who's 18 years old could conceivably run for the board then? Conceivably, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I just want to do a time check um, on this section. Are we are we good? We are. Okay. Um, quick question. Uh, just we have a few folks that might be just on the phone. Is there anybody on the phone who would like to ask a question that you don't have access to the chat? Jane, can you see any evidence of that? Um, I think we're good. Okay. 
And then so um, uh, we had another question come through the chat, Senator Martwick. Um, was a hybrid board considered? Um, Taking the hybrid approach and just staying with that as opposed to going to a fully elected board. I'm assuming that's the, what the question means. Yes, um, it was um, discussed immensely. Um, so again, just to give you a little bit of history, when this was first started to gain movement back in 2015, 14, 15, whatever it was, 16, um, I met with representatives of Mayor Emanuel's administration. And at one point I proposed a hybrid board as a solution uh, or a resolution, a compromise. And um, I was resoundingly dismissed. I was told that no one could possibly run Chicago Public Schools other than Rahm Emanuel. That's what I was told by his top administration. And I thought to myself, wow, really? Um, and, and so I said, you know, and I literally offered that. Here's a compromise, will you consider it? And the, the answer was, heck no. Okay, so if you're not gonna consider it, then I'm gonna push on with my measure, which would create a fully elected board. Um, there was discussion um, with the Lightfoot administration about a hybrid as a solution. I don't know if anybody is aware of Mayor Lightfoot's um, attempt. It was um, eight appointed members and three elected members. And, uh, you know, it, it was resoundingly laughed out of the General Assembly because that's not adequate, right? And so um, without any sort of um, legitimate efforts at compromise, um, then you have to decide what you want. Do you want to keep the status quo of a fully elected board? Do you want to move on to, I mean, of a fully appointed board, or do you move to a fully elected board? I've always been a believer in a uh, a, a fully elected board. I, I don't really like people looked at, well, this would be a compromise. And I, I would say, yeah, but why, right? Like, why should we do it different than other places um, to the extent that you would keep some appointed and some elected? And for illustration, one of the things I would talk about with um, the hybrid, just to, and again, it, it was for illustration purposes, I would say, um, and at the time it was the Emanuel administration, and people would say, well, Mayor Emanuel should have some appointments on the board. And I would say, why? And they say, well, because he's the mayor. And I would say, right, right, right. But the CPS is a separate and distinct form of government. They have their own taxing and spending authority, and they actually have their own governing board. And I said, where? Where does it exist that one executive of a separate and distinct form of government appoints the governing board of another form of government? And if we're going to do that model, why Rahm Emanuel? He's not very popular. How about, how about Tony Preckwinkle? Because I mean, the CPS is entirely within Cook County. Why not? And people would say, well, that doesn't make any sense. And I'd say, well, if it doesn't make any sense for Tony Preckwinkle, why does it make sense for Rahm Emanuel? How about just because it's always been done that way? So, well, wait a minute. How about somebody everybody likes? How about Tom Dart? I mean, he's the Cook County Sheriff. Everybody likes Tom Dart. How about he appoints him? People would say, what? And I would say, exactly, right? If it doesn't make sense for anybody else to do it, why does it make sense for the mayor of Chicago? Again, the city of Chicago does not provide financial assistance to the school. It's a separate form of government. And democracy dictates that we make those decisions. And we engage, in, in, and so that's why I've always been a, a believer in a fully elected school board, but I, I guess that's the long answer. The, the short answer is yes, it was considered. We did explore, we did try some options. It just doesn't make sense to me, so. Okay, one moment, I, just a time check because we wanna make sure Kate sure. has her a lot of time. Are, are um, Ray and Jane, are we still good on time? Yeah. Yes. Okay, okay, because we had a couple questions come in and they, they could be rather sizable explanations. So I'm gonna uh, try to condense them and then ask the Senator to also be concise. 
Um, we've got questions coming in about the size of the board. And you referenced previously about other boards and other large cities about their size. 21, 20 to 21 sounds like a large number. Um, so, you know, it, it appears like it's good. That would be costly and unworkable. Um, is there any effort uh, or research that was put into this to help that be a more workable and efficient board? Yes. So um, I believe one of the um, the uh, quotes from Mayor Lightfoot during this was that 20 is just it's unwieldy. You won't be able to get 20 people to agree on lunch, to which my response was uh, they're not supposed to agree on lunch. There's someone supposed to propose a ham sandwich and someone says uh, we'd like McDonald's and then they discuss it. They debate it. They take a vote on it and they live by what the outcome is. That's how democracy works. Um, we have 50 members of the city council, 59 members of the Illinois Senate, 118 members of the Illinois House of Representatives. We do, we conduct our business, we discuss, we debate, we vote, we live by the outcomes of the vote. That's the way democracy works. I really think the size of the board is irrelevant. Um, in fact, what was more important to me, I would point out that the three biggest things that people said to me, I said this at the beginning, was limiting the influence of outside money, providing adequate opportunities for diverse representation, and making sure that local schools had a voice in the process. And the way that you do that is by more seats, not less. Um, it's 135,000 people per district in, with 20 districts. I grew up in the village of Norwich, 15,000 people in the village of Norwich, seven elected school board members. Okay, so you're 2,000 versus 135,000. So um, for me, the deciding factor was not how long their meetings would be, because like I said, they will discuss, debate, vote, and live by the outcome, that's democracy. To me, what was more important were those three concerns, smaller districts to limit the influence of outside money and making sure that there was adequate representation and that everyone had an opportunity to serve on that board. Senator, we have a question that goes back to the districts and there is a concern about the transparency of uh, drawing the school board districts. I think there's not a confidence that it's going to be as transparent based on uh, state district maps. So um, will there be any protections or guarantees that this process will be uh, transparent for the school board districts? Yes, I mean, all I can offer again is, is to, to work within the confines, the four corners of the existing law. And um, there will be a process for public input. Um, we will hold hearings on the maps. People will be able to weigh in. People will be able to draw their own maps and submit their own maps for consideration. And, uh-oh, did I lose you guys? We hear you. Okay, um, that was really weird. Hold on one second. I don't know. I just went black. Let me see if I can find out what happened here. You can still hear me? We can hear you and we see your picture. You do. Okay. Well, I can't see you. I don't know what happened. I don't know. Well, we see your still picture. We don't see your live video, but. All right. Well, if you can do without uh, my live video, I'll just continue to proceed as long as we're still hooked up here. So, um, so, so it will follow the same process that the um, drawing of the legislative maps, uh, uh, how that process worked out. Um, again, I, I, I will not defend any criticism of it. Um, I think that there are people who like it, people who don't like it, you know, um, but it is the existing laws that we have and we will do our best to make it as transparent as possible as we go forward. Thanks. So there are two questions related to the, the power of the elected school board. So um, would the CPS elected school board be able to ask for referendum um, from voters such as an increased tax rate for schools? Uh, yes, um, they would have the same power as every other school district. So they would be able to place referenda on the ballot and, and uh, for additional funding, yes. Okay, and then um, do you have a sense of what level of decisions from the board would require um, either a simple majority or two thirds majority? 
I, I, I would not know the specifics of that. Again, it would be the, the, the school board would be uh, subject to the same uh, rules and requirements, duties and responsibilities as every other school district in the state. The only thing that they differ from would be the, the basic structure, but everything else is followed and listed in the school code. Okay. I believe we've gone through the, ch the questions that are in the chat. Um, last call for anyone on the phone for submitting a question. And, and we have just one minute left. Oh, I planned it exactly that way. Uh, <laughs> That's great. Okay, well, um, thank you, Senator Martwork, and thank you to all of these excellent questions that came through. And I'm going to hand it back uh, to, uh, to Ray. Okay, well, thank you very much for taking your time on a Saturday, uh, giving us the information we need. And I am sure we will come back to you with more questions as we delve farther into the law. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time and showing an interest in this. It's, uh, it's always good to have the discussion. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Okay. Um, now, uh, Kate, Mark, uh, Kate Grossman, uh, are you still there? I'm here. Okay, good. Kate um, is going to talk to us about the stakeholders and the community and the reactions of the stakeholders and the community to the new law. Um, she's also uh, reported on the law, so she has a very good understanding of what is happening. So, uh, Kate, do you want to get started with some of your ideas? Sure. Can I just also ask Senator Martwick just two quick questions? Um, I just want to clarify, I know there was talk about trying to do something after the bill passed around campaign finance. It's specific to the elected school board bill. It sounds like that hasn't or isn't going to happen. Is that correct? Is he still there? His picture is. <laughs> I think he just Dropped stepped up. Down. Yeah. Yeah, but that's something okay. we could definitely like make note of and and follow up. Yeah. With okay, so it sounds will... like no, but I just wanted to clarify. I would gather no. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So um, so I'm the education editor at WBEZ Chicago Public Radio. Um, I have been covering Chicago public schools on and off for about twenty years. Um. So uh, a lot of the things that Senator Martwick talked about, I have been uh, seen with my own two eyes. Um, also grew up in Chicago, so know a lot of the history as lived experience. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was um, basically three things. I wanted to add a little bit to what the Senator talked about. It's sort of like where the elected school board bill came from. Um, I wanted to talk about sort of like how it ended up passing at this moment in time, you know, last June when it passed. And then sort of as we move forward into, as we anticipate its passage, and then when it's actually, you know, in place, kind of like what issues to look for, um, you know, as citizens in Chicago and um, potential voters. Um, so just to add a little bit to, to what the Senator said, um, just the context of, of where we were, where we are, how we got to where we are now. So as you all know, we have a appointed school board and that started um, in 1995 in Chicago. I think Chicago was, I believe the first big city to go to mayoral control. Um, now most big cities have the mayor of, controls the school board. Um, and the prompt for this was that in the seventies and eighties, you know, Chicago public schools really struggled. There were teacher strikes year, you know, year after year after year, a lot of financial distress, like a pretty major exodus, you know, population decline. So there's a lot of distress in the school system. And um, it sort of culminated in 1995, there was a Republican majority in the state legislature. The mayor basically said, like, if I'm going to be blamed for the problems with the school system, I want to be in control of the school system. So this bill, this major bill was passed that gave the mayor 
control of the school system so that he would point, appoint, directly appoint the school board. Previously, there was like a, a commission where he would get names and choose for those names and appoint them. But now he had direct appointment power. We stopped having a, like a superintendent. Now we have a CEO. So the first CEO was Paul Vallis, who had no ed background. Um, so we, you know, we stopped having an education focus for the CEO position. We also like sort of disentangled, like freed up a lot of money so that school district had more flexibility in how it spent its money. Um, so that was a huge change. And so that was 1995. So that set the stage for kind of where, where we are today. Um, you know, and that, you know, the, the good thing about that from the perspective of people who, who wanted that was that it made for a, a very efficient board, right? <laughs> there wasn't, there was no dissent. Um, they made decisions quickly. They, you know, they, in the first couple of years of that board, they brought the school system back to solvency. Um, they did a huge construction boom, uh, construction programs. They built a ton of schools and they passed a lot, a lot of policies. You know, Paul Vallis did put all these schools on probation and remediation and all these different programs to try to turn around schools um, and did social promotion. So, um, so, you know, some of those things were definitely controversial and people didn't like, but, you know, they were efficient, right? They got a lot of stuff done. Um, and the argument was that having mayoral control gave the board power to do some difficult but necessary things that needed to happen. Um, but what started happening, as the Senator mentioned, were a lot of policies that were really pretty radical. Like he mentioned this Renaissance 2010, which was basically the closing of a lot of schools and replacing them with charter schools, essentially. So hundred, the goal was to create a hundred new schools. Um, and so that happened in the, you know, the 2000s, in the, in the aughts, I guess we call them. Um, and that was the beginning, you know, under Mayor Daley. And then that continued into the, you know, from 2010 to 2020, like opening a lot of charter schools and sort of this privatization model of education. And that's really what galvanized um, this interest in having an elected school board because this feeling was that the board was making these really monumental decisions, particularly in communities of color. And the board was, you know, tended to be uh, made up of, you know, people from academia or the business world and not representative at all of the people who send their kids to the school system and th that they were, and that the efforts at, you know, community input were like totally perfunctory and pretty much meaningless. Um, and so, and then it sort of culminated, you know, in 2013 with this mass 50 school closings and that, that really catalyzed a lot of people. You know, I sat there in the CPS boardroom where they, the board voted like one after another with no dissent to close 50 schools. And I think people were just amazed and appalled that there was just not any dissent at all for any one of those schools. And they went through this whole process of supposed public input, which was really not really not a lot of real input. So anyway, and around the same time as all that was happening, the Chicago Teachers Union, the current leadership who's in charge now, they came into power in 2011. So that kind of dovetailed with this grassroots movement that was growing around, you know, demanding more input. And so these two groups, this grassroots groups, groups that Martwick talked about and the teachers union, they were both demanding the same thing, which is they wanted real democracy um, at, at the school board. Um, so, you know, as an observer of all this, I honestly kind of never thought we would get an elected school board. It just seemed like the powers that be didn't want it. And so I kind of like, we covered it. We're like, oh yeah, okay, they want it. There seemed like there was a lot of interest in it from the grassroots folks, but it didn't really penetrate the sort of upper corridors. It just seemed like it was a grassroots effort, even if it had a lot of support. Um, Rahm Emanuel, as the Senator said, was like vehemently opposed. Um, and, you know, he, he was pretty powerful and kind of ruled with an iron fist in a lot of ways. So that wasn't just didn't seem likely to happen. But 
things tipped. Um, and um, I, I kind of put it at, I think sort of in 2020 with sort of the racial reckoning of George Floyd and I kind of see that as a really, really important moment of sort of piercing the public consciousness beyond sort of the grassroots crowd of like the need for voice and representation of black and brown communities that that really catalyzed a lot of people to think differently um, about this issue. I don't know, just a shift after that, that that kind of changed that was one of of several things but i think that was an important shift that kind of took this over the edge for an issue that was like very popular among grassroots folks but that kind of brought it into public consciousness so that was one really big thing and then and then you have some you had some changes in the state legislature which of course were very significant so you know as you've heard from the senator for many years he'd been trying to get this passed and in fact it passed the house twice in 2017 and 2019 um, by wide margins actually, but it was never called for a vote in the Senate because the Senate president at the time, John Cullerton was opposed and was also in a alignment doing the bidding of Rahm Emanuel who was very opposed to it. And so it never came for a vote in the Senate. Um, he retires and then Don Harmon, who's now the Senate president, um, seemed more open to it. And then finally this year in April, there was this major breakthrough where he said to us at WBZ that he was, he wanted to bring a bill to the floor on the Senate to, to move to a fully elected school board. And that was like earth, you know, earth moving, <laughs> right? So um, we had had, um, you know, this opposition, this block in the Senate for years, the supporters had. And so this was a major, major change. You know, we had quoted him on the air saying, when in doubt, err on the side of democracy. So that that's a significant change. Um, now, Harmon knew that, the, you know, Lori Lightfoot, who, the, you know, the Senator Martwick told you about was opposed to an elected school board that she wanted a hybrid board. And so as a nod to her, he, his proposal, he, he wanted to transition, you know, to have this period that, that he explained to you where we start as this hybrid board, you know, partly elected, partly appointed. And so he was committed to this transitional period. And so there was between April and June of this year, there was a lot of negotiations about the particulars on that. And of course, the people who were diehard supporters in the elected school board were like adamantly opposed to that. They wanted to go whole hog elected school board right away. And that almost sunk the bill because they were so passionate about that. Um, but I don't know exactly all the inner workings on that. I mean, but I do know that in early June, it looked like this was not gonna happen because the supporters of the fully elected board were so opposed. Um, but in the last minute in June, they pulled a deal together um, where, you know, as Smartwick described of what the final bill would be. Um, but so they did pass it, but the bottom line, and I think the important thing to note for understanding why it did pass is that basically Lori Lightfoot completely lost, <laughs> you know, like she was opposed to a fully elected school board, which is what is coming to the city of Chicago, not right away, but like by 2027, we will have a fully elected school board in Chicago. And she was adamantly opposed to that, to the particulars of this bill, you know, the way Martwick described it. And she raised a lot of concerns about it. The things that, that Martwick talked about, the size of the bill, the concern about the influence of money, um, several things, which, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail later, but none of those basically were really addressed in any meaningful way to her satisfaction. So she lost, um, and which tells you part of the reason why it passed. Um, you know, in addition to so the, the public mood had totally changed, the Senate had changed, but she was also, it was a reflection of her power base, right? She's not, um, she doesn't have a strong constituency in the state legislature. 
certainly the way Rahm Emanuel and certainly the way Mayor Daley did. She doesn't, she's not a coalition builder. She didn't have a long history of working with state legislators. She didn't get people on her team, basically. Um, even though there were, there was actually quite a lot of people who didn't want the elected school board who are in positions of power. There was lots of grumbling that we heard from people who didn't want the elected school board. In fact, more than grumbling, I mean, Janice Jackson, the most recent CEO of Chicago Public Schools, did not want an elected school board. And that was probably one of the many reasons she resigned. Um, she was opposed to it. Um, a lot of you know business leaders were opposed. I know a fair number of Chicago public school parents were opposed. Of course, there are a lot of Chicago public school parents that are strongly supportive of it, but there's a constituency of parents who are opposed to it. So there were, there's definitely a constituency of people who did not want it, but the winds had changed so dramatically in favor of an elected school board that people were kind of just like, well, this is going to happen, <laughs> basically, and and Lightfoot wasn't powerful enough to marshal those forces behind her to stop it, basically. Um, and um, sorry, look at my notes here. Um, so, a couple of the issues for why people were opposed and are opposed, even though it's obviously now happening, is, is this, one is the size. You know, people, and we've already discussed this, um, this concern that with 21 members, this is more than double the size of any other big city um, elected school board in New York or LA. Um, what do I have notes here? I think, uh, I'll have to look it up, but other school boards are smaller. I think it's, this is double the size. Um, yeah, LA has seven, New York City has 15. This will be 21. So the concern about that is basically that the board will be broken into factions. You know, there'll be, even though there'll be people elected from various districts, there'll be sort of a CTU faction, and then there'll maybe be a business interest faction, and maybe there'll be like an advocates faction, or I don't know, those are probably the main three factions, and it might be impossible to get things passed. I don't know, maybe it won't be, but that's the concern. Um, you know, there's also this concern about money. So maybe, I mean, I think Senator Martwick made a good argument in favor of you know, they, they did obviously try to, they were very thoughtful about trying to set up a structure to limit the influence of money with these districts, but there are still going to be districts, wealthier neighborhoods, where there's going to be a lot of money spent on these elections, and there will definitely be a lot of money spent on the election for the president, the school board president. Um, and I mean, he's right, like we live in a country where this is this is this is the way it is, right? We spend a lot of money on elections, but this was there was talk of trying to address it very specifically to have campaign rules for the elected school board, and that doesn't look like they've made any specific efforts around that. Um, there's also the issue that um, undocumented people can't vote in this election. Um, you know, we have a lot of people who are undocumented who are parents in Chicago public school systems, so they're disenfranchised. Um, those parents can currently vote in local school council elections, which is great. Um, and so they're excluded. Um, so that's, you know, a problem. Um, so those are all things to be thinking about as we're moving forward with this. Um, and also another issue to think about is with these districts, um, that as they draw them, there's a concern that um, wealthier districts might be end up having more influence because the, they want the districts to be about 135,000 people per district. But the concern is that you, in areas that are more, more white and middle class, um, 
they, oh, and they want them to be 135 and they want them to be contiguous. So neighborhoods attached. And so, you know, those, those neighborhoods tend to be more heavily populated. So um, they could sort of end up being, you know, more districts, more powerful because they're, I'm looking at my notes to make sure I'm explaining this right. Um, they can end up having more districts basically because their neighborhoods are more heavily populated. Um, you know, Delia Ramirez, who's the, um, who she was the house sponsor of the bill when we talked to her about this, she acknowledged that that could be a problem, but she also made the point that right now parents have zero representation on the school board. So it could be a problem and they'll pay attention to it, but they have no representation. So it's something to consider, but better than what we have now. Um, the other thing to pay attention to moving forward um, is a couple other things. Um, this, Martwick mentioned that there's a moratorium on school closings um, until the elected school board is seated. No, yeah, and so that's, well, until the hybrid board is seated, that's January, 2025. Um, the, Enrollment in Chicago public schools is like fallen through the floor. Um, you know, we closed 50 schools in 2013. And since then, the enrollment decline has only accelerated. There's been a loss in the last decade of more than, I think it's 74,000 students. Um, so we have a lot of schools that are severely under enrolled. I'm not saying closing schools is the right answer, but it is, it's an issue. Um, so it's just something to pay attention to as over the next two years, how is CPS gonna manage its enrollment issue without the ability, and it's not just closures, it's consolidations too. You can't close or consolidate schools. Um, something also to pay attention to is how will the new, how will a CEO manage with an elected school board? I mean, obviously we have this only a history of having an appointed school board. You know, Pedro Martinez, the current CEO has been asked this question. He was the uh, superintendent in San Antonio and he, where there was an elected school board and he says, oh, worked out great. You know, I didn't have any problem. He's a sunny guy. <laughs> He's puts a positive spin on things. Um, I don't know how it went really in San Antonio, um, but it's certainly something to pay attention to. Um, it's, it, it's certainly a challenge, a new challenge um, to try to manage a particular board of that size. Um, and then the last issue to pay attention to is the Chicago Teachers Union. Um, they're obviously very powerful and um, they are only more powerful than they used to be because um, they, as part of that 1995 law that I mentioned where the city took control of the school board, it, as part of that law, their bargaining rights were clipped. Basically, they were restricted to bargaining only over salary and wages. They, they, they could potentially bargain over other things, but only if basically if CPS allowed them to, things like class size and the length of the school year, et cetera. Um, that changed in April when a law passed that restored all of their bargaining rights. So now the teachers union has full bargaining rights. So in the next negotiations, which is, uh, the contract ends in 2024, they'll be able to negotiate over everything. Um, so whatever your view is on that, it just gives them increased power. Um, and so for the elected school board, that just it makes them an even greater force to be reckoned with. Um, so those, so I just sort of laid out a bunch of things to think about as we move forward into the future with an elected school board. Um, so those are pretty much all my comments and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Kate. We do have a couple questions in the chat and I think some more will come through. So 
um, kind of hearkening back to the statement that you made about the districts uh, contiguous and the density um, density of districts uh, uh, aligned with one another. We have a question coming in that says, um, do you imagine that um, individuals who run for the school board president will align with the slates of the individual district candidates or you know that power of the districts and how that's going to affect the election of the school board president? Um, you know, that's a good question. I, I have not given that any thought. Um, I, it's certainly a distinct possibility that there would be a slate, right? You know, that there would be a CTU slate, for example, or a parent slate, um, which would kind of defeat the purpose. I think the way Mark Wick was kind of laying out the vision for it. Um, but that's, I have, I hadn't really, I have not actually given this a ton of thought, but that's certainly something that could happen and I could see very easily happening and very actually quite likely happening. Okay, we have a, another question. This is more uh, politics related, but do you think that um, Mayor Lightfoot's opposition to the elected school board um, will have an impact on her run for reelection? You know, I wondered about, you know, there's a lot of reasons why Mayor Lightfoot may not run for re-election, um, but um, this may be one of them. I mean, she she would be, if she just opts not to run for re-election, she would be done being mayor of the city of Chicago before we have an elected school board, which may be something that she wants. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't. She obviously does not want an elected school board. She doesn't think that's right for the city of Chicago. And so um, that may factor into her decision-making. Okay, um, I don't have other questions in the chat, but our, our committee had formulated some prior to setting up um, this briefing. Um, oh, so one popped in. So let me, let me jump to that question. Um, Kate, do you have a sense of how community groups on the South and West sides are developing their potential candidates for school board? Um, I think it's too early. You know, we don't even have the districts yet. Um, but I would imagine that, you know, all the community organizing that Martwick talked about that's been gone on, for, that has gone on for years that I would imagine that the folks that are part of those organizations are probably the most likely people to run. Um, there's, there's a lot of, one of the amazing things about covering public school or covering schools in general is the passion. Um, there's a lot, a lot of community organizations all over the city and a lot of passionate people. Um, so I would assume that candidates will emerge from those groups in the early days. Um, but I, it's, it, I think it's just too early to have candidates yet. And I also, there was something that Senator Martwick said, you know, when he, you know, when someone made, when he was defending the idea that the board was, wasn't too big and that, well, you know, the city council has 50 and the, you know, Illinois General Assembly has, you know, whatever, how many ever they have, and they get stuff done. And I mean, that's a valid argument, but there's schools are, people are really, really passionate about schools. Not that people aren't passionate in the Illinois General Assembly, but I mean, people will uh, not give on their school, you know, if they're if they feel strongly about something, compromises, I don't see a lot of room for compromise. Um, so, and also because, you know, part of the reason, part of the reason the Illinois General Assembly and the city council work is because you have a strong leader in charge, you know, in the mayor or in Springfield, uh, Mike Madigan, <laughs> 
although we see how that's turning out. But um, you have to have a really strong leader in charge. So to be able to corral the folks together so that you can get a, to get to yes, get to a to a majority vote. So maybe maybe that'll happen. I think that's why that board president position is is so crucial. Okay, we have another question, and this is dealing with the impact of um, disenfranchisement of undocumented parents. Could you uh, give us your more thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, this was an issue that Mayor Lightfoot brought up a lot. Um, and um, I mean, it, it was never resolved. Um, there was talk of trying to resolve it, but I, I don't know. I assume it's because, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, going to be held on a ballot the same time that the, you know, the national election is going to be held right. and that probably presumably the, the election rules preclude you from giving undocumented people the right to vote. I don't actually know the, the, the legal background, but I assume that that's why they're excluded um, and that why they can be included in a local school council race. But it's, it seems like a, a glaring omission given, given the student population that we have in Chicago public schools. Well, and Kate, you, you referenced the local school councils. This is not a question from the chat, but a discussion um, the education committee, the daytime committee has had about local school councils, which we've looked at over the last couple of years ourselves, uh, trying to get more people involved in those elections. And so we've noted that we've seen a decline, obviously in the um, uh, engagement in local school councils in some of the areas where these parents will likely be disenfranchised specifically, and that those local school councils are more effective in certain areas rather than others. And so they were, there was excitement about it when they, they first were implemented, and now there's kind of a, a general decline. So is this kind of a two-part question. Do you see this elected school board providing some energy into the local school council efforts? Or do you think um, the elected school board may have a decline in interest based on disenfranchisement? Um, well, I think I think first, I mean, the local school councils are just very uneven. I mean, some some local school councils have tons of candidates and are really active, and some don't have enough candidates and scrape by. I mean, it's the same cycle every election. Basically, you know, a week before the candidates applications are due, they have a fraction of the candidates they need, they extend, CPS extends the deadline, um, and then they get a bunch more, and then they scrape and beg, and <laughs> they usually end up getting generally enough candidates, although there's always local school councils that, that are short. Um, so, um, you know, which is unfortunate, but there are some local school councils that that work quite well. Um, so, but I, I mean, I think like with anything else, like the school board election will get tons of attention the first couple of cycles and then it'll sort of like, you know, like anything else that's no longer shiny and new, people will not be as interested in it. Um, but I, it, it might, it might, uh, engender more interest in the local school council races because people will be more aware of public school issues, folks who might not have been paying attention, um, perhaps people who don't have kids in the school system. Um, you know, I think generally people who don't have kids in the school system don't vote in the local school council elections. Um, I think that's generally the rule. Um, I don't know I think they're kind of I think they're kind of different really like local school it's your the people vote in their local school council election for their school because they care about their particular school um 
and then but you would it's they're they're there i mean they're connected but they're really separate issues right you you you're when you're voting for the the school board election you're you're interested in the broad policies affecting cps you're interested in what's the policy on social promotion what's the policy on school closing what's the policy on I don't know, whatever it is, but broad policies versus local school council, you care about who the principal is, what the budget is, and like some specific policy in your school building. So I think there might be an uptick basically to answer your question in local school council interests because of the school board election, but I, I kind of think they're actually separate. Okay, thanks for fielding that uh, comparative question. I'm going to stop and see, um, Jane, if you could help me. Is there, do we have any questions that might be coming in from a caller? Uh, as of right now, no. Okay, great. Um, well, a uh, question just popped in. Um, I'm going to read it directly. I haven't had time to process it. School board meetings in general across the country have been getting lots of attention such as around critical race theory, COVID, masks, and other hot button issues. Um, do you think this could happen in this case? Um, yeah, I mean, the it's those issues are not as present in CPS. Um, well, I'll take them one by one. Critical race theory, theory hasn't really been an issue in Chicago public schools that that's been more of an issue in more conservative places where people make accusations about schools teaching critical race theory and you know being this, this is a pretty liberal city. Um, it just hasn't come up. I mean, I listen to the CPS board meeting every month. Um, and that never comes up. Um, so, I mean, COVID, of course, and masking come up every month. Um, you know, on a Monday, the mask mandate for Chicago Public Schools is lifting. Uh, the last board meeting, there were lots of comments, pro and con, for that. Um, I think once the board is elected, they'll maybe they'll be more interested in the board meetings. Right now, it's pretty um, contained. The interest is to you know, to the 30 people who sign up to speak in the public comment section of the board meeting and reporters and other people, but perhaps, and I think that would be a great thing if more people, more people will come to the board meetings or watch them on YouTube. Um, but I don't, I don't expect the issues to change markedly because, um, I mean, we're still going to be the same city with the same politics. It'll just be magnified, I think, <laughs> with an elected school board. So right now, there aren't any more questions in the chat. Um, actually, I have one of my own, and this is for kind of the work we did from our committee to, to bring this briefing. Um, I can say that, like, we looked at the the legislation and we've tried to sort through it out and despite our commitment our own educational status etc it's a hard topic okay you know and as you can hear in today's discussion there were a lot of dates and timelines and this is going to happen at certain intervals so my question is um, and this is more just from a community communications perspective um, is WBEC or you or anybody putting together some kind of an infographic that can help us and the general public understand what's going to happen when and then basically formulate our um, expectations and also maybe even our questions as we go through this rather long process of having an elected school board? Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's a great idea. <laughs> um, I mean, so from a news perspective, this is pretty far down the field, right? So we're not talking about an election until November, 2024. Um, you know, here we are in March, 2022. Um, so 
I think the next news opportunity will come when, you know, these districts get drawn. Um, you know, that's sort of the journalist in me, how we think about it. Like, and because also people, and that's not just sort of being crass, but also like people don't activate to think about things until there's something where they actually have to do something, right? I mean, if you if you give people information too far ahead of something, like they're not gonna really pay attention. Um, so I could see us doing something, certainly coverage around when the districts are drawn and certainly ahead of the first election, you know, doing an infographic, a chart that shows like, you know, November 20, 24, you will vote on 10 districts, you know, there'll be 10, like just laying out like the timetable. It seems very complicated, but basically there's just like, first it'll be a board that's mixed, some appointed, some elected, and then two years later, it'll be a fully elected school board. Like we could make that pretty simple for people. Um, so I think those that's a great idea. Um, but there's actually not much happening right now um, in terms of candidates raising their hands, preparing. They don't even know what the districts are. Um, they're not fundraising. There's they're not circulating petition. Like there's nothing happening right now. Like so. Um, I don't, I don't think from a citizen perspective, I mean, I think this conversation is great. Like it forced me to kind of get myself back in this and think through things and learn some things that I didn't know. Um, but I don't think there's a lot to do at the moment. Thank you. Thanks for fielding that. Um, Ray, Jane, I don't have any more questions in the chat. All right. Well, I, we really appreciate you taking your time, Kate, to inform us about what's going on. We like to get information ahead. It takes us a while to digest all the information, figure it out, and decide what we want to do next. So that's why we decided to start so early. We know that it's two years off, but those two years will pass very quickly. Yeah. So we really appreciate you coming and speaking to us. Thank you so much.